put yourself in situations that are uncomfortable as a comedian because okay. you may be a great comic, but are you great at crowd work? Are you great at one-liners? Are you great at storytelling? Are you great at roasting? It's like, just try to work on all those muscles. It'll make you a better, well-rounded comic, and now you're, you're ready for any situation. Hot breath. What's goody, Hot breath Averse? Welcome back to Hot Breath, the show where you learn comedy from the pros. I'm your host, comedian Joel Byers, and our guest today is the living success story of what we preach here at Hot Breath, that self-made comedy hustle. One year in his career, he actually drove over 168,000 miles, <laughs> sleeping in his car doing road gigs. But it all started in New York when he was sweeping floors at Caroline's, where in this New York scene, he actually holds the record for doing 13 shows in one night that he actually created a documentary about available on YouTube. But since then, he has self-produced his own... Mo Wait, you can open that door. Leave the door open oh, for that yeah, light the there. Light, the light right there, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Speaking of self-made uh, hustle, that's what we're doing here with over 400 interviews with comedians here at Hot Breath. But this guy self-produced his own movies, his own documentaries, his own podcast, his own comedy specials, where most recently... It is available on Amazon, The Last Late Night. Welcome to the Hot Breath of our Steve Byrne. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a hell of an introduction. Yes. You should say that every time I enter my bedroom. And my <laughs> wife can hear that. <laughs> just come in boxer briefs. I just brushed my teeth. You give that whole dispeal. It'd be, it'd be great. All right. Well, we, yeah. can, we can clip that for you. <laughs> okay. That's how that's I'll go good, viral. Yeah. I'll finally blow up because I'm a meme in bedrooms. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. We've done over 400 interviews. So Holy we're, cow. That's we're amazing. We're out here trying to do it, Steve. 401. And you're, you're someone who always likes to give back to young comedians and help young comedians. What? Try to. I mean, yeah. like even tonight, you see all these comics sitting around. It's like, I know what it's like. You, you walk in and you're, you're there to watch the show. But in the back of your head, I mean, you're, you're, you're dreaming. I hope to God I get up tonight. And, uh, you know, it's like, I mean, it's no sweat of me to lose five more minutes. So, yeah, of course. Who, who, was, who was that comedian or those comedians for you that really, like, helped you early on? I mean, I'd say a lot of the New York comics were really, really um, kind to me. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I passed at the cellar maybe like a year and a half, two years into comedy, so I got really lucky pretty quickly. And and getting to know Jim Norton, and Greg Giraldo, and Rich Ross, and Colin Quinn, and Robert Kelly, Bill Burr. You know, if I was a freshman, Bobby and Bill were like sophomores, but then you had like Patrice and Quinn and all those guys. They were like running the room and running the table and. Yes, they were. <laughs> there were a lot of insults and very, very creative insults. But at the same time, you know, they'd also take you on the road with them. So I got to open for Jim Norton, got to open for Voss and Keith Robinson. And to this day, those were one of the first few times I went on the road and really was like, wow, I'm working with somebody I saw on Comedy Central. This is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what do you think now? I mean, you've been in the game over 25 years and I, I've been in the game 13 years. Yep. And just to see how it's gone from like, get on stage as much as possible to now like comedians are bringing in like red cams to film open mics for crowd work yeah. clips. Like the evolution of this is like, yeah, gone are the days where you could just be a stand up. I mean, you've got to be like multi multifaceted. You've got to be able to, uh, yeah. Can you can keep you that, door that door? Open? Can you keep that Everybody other door open with the light on it? That door. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bud. Right. That's okay. Oh, that's Actually, even better. Actually, it's better now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, you're, you're totally right. I mean, you got people that have been doing it two or three years that are like, it's not just crowd work. It's like they're putting out specials. Yeah. It's like, don't fucking put that out. <laughs> you don't want that out. Give it 10. Don't, don't film anything that's longer than 10 minutes mm. and put it out there if you haven't been doing it more than 10 years. You're going to be embarrassed by it. It's going to live forever. People clip it. It's going to be embarrassing. It could come back and haunt you. Very few people are that good. Mm. I would say don't fucking do it. Just if you're doing stand-up comedy and it's a real profession, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. So, so think of the long game. Yeah, I didn't. I self-produced a comedy special on my 10-year anniversary. So I waited well, there you for go. 10 years ten to exactly. even like try to get anything out there. Yeah, and it's probably really, really great. Had you done it five years earlier, you would have had you know probably 20 great minutes in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would suggest to anybody, 10 years, 10 years for sure. So what, in your like over 25 years, did you have any moments? Because like I'm, I'm kind of currently going through this mm -hmm. of like, like pre-pandemic, I was starting to do a lot of comedy zones. I was getting like some sure. headlining, roading work, and I was about to be on the road a lot more. And then okay. all of a sudden overnight, I'm unemployed. And then it kind of hit me of like, 
I mean, do, am I even about that life? Like, it, it's I've kind of been gone back and forth. I'm like, I mean, do I even want to be out on the road? Would I rather be mm-hmm. home with my family? Do I need to find other ways? Like, sure. Ha- did you ever go through anything like that in your career? Well, I go through it all the time. I mean, I go through it now. I've been doing this 25 years, and you mentioned all those credits, and still, it's like you're still trying to. Everybody goes through ebbs and flows in their career. I don't mm-hmm. care how big you are right now. There's a lot of comics that are very doing very well, but you're going to hit that, you, you know, the peaks and valleys. And I had a great peak, and I've had a really low valley, and I'm crawling out of it now. It's, it's, it's really hard to do it once. It's extremely difficult to do it twice. And so that's what I'm up against right now. And, you know, I think with, like, the last late night and these projects I'm working on, maybe that'll take me over the hump the next round. But I've always made my bread and butter on, at the clubs, and it's been great. But, uh, but yeah, I mean... You, you know, it def- de- there definitely is a fatigue factor that comes into like, Jesus Christ, I got to go to the fucking airport. And you could be <laughs> in the nicest hotel in the world, but it's still not your home. And yeah. FaceTime and the kids and the misses, it just it, it, it does wear on you. But then it's also like, but you're a gypsy. This is what you fucking signed up for. And this is what you dreamed about when you were in your 20s. When you're in your 20s, you dream about doing this. So it's like you also can't take it for granted. What what is what was the valley? What what valley did you just go through? Well, I, I think there there's, you know, I had a TV show, I had a documentary, a feature film that comes out during pandemic. Like, you know, once the the show kind of ended, you kind of dip down again, and you got to mm. like reestablish yourself. So it's like the, the doc, the the film, but there's just all the elements of business that come into this, and ticket sales, and managers, and agents, and representation. Ultimately, what it comes down to is relevance. Are you relevant or not? And I think to truly make it in this business, you got to have at least one hit. You got to have a hit. You can get on base all you want. And I've always gotten on base. I never had a problem with that. But I just, the thing that eluded me is a genuine hit, you know? Mm. Um, some people have a hit via podcast. Some people have a hit via an hour special that came out at the right time on the right platform that everybody heard about. Um, but I've always been consistent in terms of work and producing and creating but it just you know i wouldn't say sullivan and son was a hit i wouldn't say the opening act was a hit i wouldn't say the jonathan doc was a hit they're all sweat equity it's all a lot of passion and there's an education in it and so i've learned to do a hell of a lot more than a lot of other comedians i can bring assets to the table of writing directing starring in producing in cobbling you know assembling packaging uh, i've got a good I got a good uh, education on the landscape of the industry itself, but again, it's like you just keep putting yourself in that batter's box and praying, okay, maybe this is the one, and then you get tailwinds, you can kind of ease up a little bit, but uh, I wouldn't even say when you when you get that hit, you can still ease up, because you still have to keep the relevance. That's even mm. harder than gaining it. Is to actually keep it. Yeah, I mean, what yeah. Tom Cruise has done is fucking remarkable. I mean, you look at somebody like that, or Tom Hanks, uh, they've had losses they've had Mm -hmm. films that have bombed like tom cruise the mummy but then he's still relevant in these mission impossible movies the top gun maverick i mean the guy's you know 60 and he's flipping around in airplanes it's fucking crazy well that's what i was the most successful film ever you saying tom made me think like tom segura or like burt kreischer who just kept swinging and swinging and swinging and then boom you know well i I think the difference with those guys is that they were never industry darlings right Mm. industry was always about you know ivy league schools the pedigree the resume and then the industry would never anoint people like that and so then you had a bunch of guys that said well fuck it i got a wi-fi i got a camera and i'm gonna go out and you know, stake my own claim. And now those podcasts are bigger than anything that they would audition for or pitch to any of the streamers or the networks. I mean, they're making more money now than you would if you got a a series at Netflix. So it's like, why would you want a series at Netflix if you're in that situation? Ride that out as long as you can. Six figures, seven seven figures, no executives telling what you can or can't do. In Mm -hmm. fact, you're being rewarded for the things you can't say by saying them on a podcast. Yeah. So... Um, I yeah, guess it's always so relative. I mean, it's like for me, a comedian, and us comedians, like see you and are like, oh my gosh, he's done these movies, these documentaries. He just released an Amazon special. Like, sure, oh, he's he's killing it. But then on the other side, you're like, oh, I mean, you know, but I it mean, is I perspective, want more. <laughs> right? Yeah, of course. I mean, everybody wants more. I think that's kind of the nature of the game. Um, yeah. you're always going to be kind of like looking in the rear view and looking in front of you and seeing what your friends are up to and everything. And as unhealthy as it is. You also want to be supportive of those people because 
any individual in this industry knows how difficult it is. It's fucking hard. It's really hard. So anybody that gets that semblance of success, it's like celebrate it for sure. Pat them person on the back because it's fucking hard. Do you have any advice for me and where I'm at right for now? For you 13 years in? I'm on a couch. This is therapy now. Yeah, yeah. this is therapy this now. Is, this um, I, I would just think whatever it is that, that, that comes your way as you go, go down the line. I mean, you look, you're doing this. This mm -hmm. is important. Um, there's for a free. Lot of, for free. But for that's, over five years. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's another part of it. I, I think so much of what you do is going to be free until you've proven yourself, right? Uh -huh. And so the Sullivan and Son I wrote on spec. That means free. I wrote the opening act on spec. The second script I wrote on spec. Sold it to Will Smith. It's like all these things, you could go out and pitch it to all these people and wait for them to give you money. But if you're an unproven commodity, you got to fucking write it. You got to swing on yourself. You always got to bet on yourself. And the good news is... You're betting on yourself, you're creating something, you're sticking with it, and you're out there hustling, you're doing stand-up. I would just recommend that as you get more involved in the industry, as the opportunities open for yourself, don't hesitate to walk in that door and see if you can learn a bit more. Like, I would never have written Sullivan and Son or the opening act without, you know, friends pushing me to say, you can do it. And it's like, really, you think I can do this? And then doing it, and now I understand narrative. Now I can watch a movie and understand the beats at five minutes, 12 minutes, 25, mm. 40, 55, and 75, and 85. Like, I know structure now, and so I know what story is. And it's because of the education I have and working with some really talented people over the years that have been patient with me to say, this is how this works. And so now because I went in just thinking, I don't know, let's see, and I'll, I'll give it my best shot. And when you do and really invest in the opportunity, you, I think you'll really be surprised at how much better of a performer and all-around entertainer you'll be if you put yourself in those situations. Uh, even with stand-up, you know, I, I did a lot of crowd work tonight. Crowd work's a muscle I've been working on with the new special, monologue jokes. Never did that up until the challenge of saying, do a late-night talk show as a stand-up. Now doing that, now understanding the cadence and flow and writing of those jokes, it's like, I wouldn't have done that if I didn't challenge myself to say, do something different this time. Do a late night talk show, right? So, so storytelling, not the best storyteller, but I forced myself to sit down in the special and tell stories. Again, all those things are different muscles in stand-up. People think, oh, just go fucking roast them. It's like, roasting's a muscle. Mm -hmm. We'll just go up and do crowd work. Crowd work's a muscle. And I think the more you put yourself in hairy situations, say, I'm going to force myself to just do one-liners tonight. I'm going to force myself to just do crowd work tonight. I think all those things will just make you a better, well-rounded comedian. So when you're either hosting the Golden Globes or you're hosting for the fucking Rotary Club and somebody drops a glass, there's a drunk guy like tonight that came up and just entered the step. Like, I'm literally prepared for anything that could fucking happen. And I know my way in and out of it. I can still control the room. And it's only because I force myself to put myself in situations like that. So for like a show... So that's what I recommend to you. Is to... Is to put yourself in situations that are uncomfortable as a comedian because okay. you may be a great comic, but are you great at crowd work? Are you great at one-liners? Are you great at storytelling? Are you great at roasting? It's like, just try to work on all those muscles. It'll make you a better, well-rounded comic, and now you're, you're ready for any situation. Yeah, I think for the first 10 years, I was like very scripted and like every line I've pre-prepared and I've mm -hmm. written and it's almost like a script. Sure. So now I am trying to be a little more like organic on stage, still having directions, but maybe being a more loose in how I get to the different yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, if you have, you know, let's say you have seven sets scheduled for the week, take five of them, do your material and take two of them and one of them, just say, I'm just going to do crowd work. And the other one, say, I'm going to work on one-liners or I'm going to work on storytelling. You know, whatever your, your weaknesses are, yeah. I would say do that. Because when I was in New York City, I always made sure if I was doing six sets a night or four sets a night, I would always dedicate one to just crowd work. Wow. And so that has got me to the point where the last three years especially, it's like a, a totally different, I don't know, it's like you can have your black belt. Then and I was like, oh, my God, something's clicking lately. Where the last three years, the crowd work is just some something where I really enjoy doing it. What what clicked for you? What do you think changed? And I brought you a water as well. That's no, some I hot appreciate it. But thank you. Yeah, I, I saw that. I wasn't sure if that was <laughs> something else's went off. But I think what clicked was was just the confidence mm. to go. Just trust yourself. Put yourself in a situation 
dig as deep of a hole as you can and then dig yourself out of it. So I would find somebody and I'd say almost something so offensive. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this. But now it's like, all right, figure it out now. And that was it. And so once I did that, now it's like, it's fucking flawless. I, I don't know. I just really, <laughs> I don't mean to fucking pat myself Not on the, the back. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, it's fucking really great. I mean, even tonight, there's, I mean, I'm talking to this 18-year-old girl with her fucking parents saying she takes it up the ass. She's a fucking whore. <laughs> yeah. She's laughing. The parents are laughing. And you're not doing it in a mean-spirited way. You're still doing it and having fun and winking at them and then doing a pendulum swing to this 18-year-old kid with, who's with his parents and then just learning how to play everybody off each other and constantly having the Rolodex flipping of going, she's a dentist, she said this, he said that, and knowing when to, when to pull the trigger on those things. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's pretty hard, but once you... Once you get it, oh, they're spinning the there. plates. It's it's fun, yeah. And I, I feel like so many young comics now, they want the crowd work clip for like TikTok. But like, where should young com- where do you think you're saying learn all these different things? A lot of them aren't good at it though. Exactly, they're fucking bad. Where and, should and, they start? Like, is crowd work? Or should they start with one liners? Like, what what does like a young comic need to start? Like, what do you think is the foundation? Well, I think uh, look, if you if you want to do crowd work, then post it. But the the audience is always going to tell you what's good or not. And I'm telling you. In my Facebook feed, on my Twitter feed, on my fucking TikTok, I see a lot of shitty fucking crowd work. It's fucking bad. Please stop. Everybody's ruining it. Andrew Schultz did it great. He was the first to kind of like post those things. Then everybody fucking did it. And there's very few. Jessica Kirsten's great. I yeah. never film mine, and I should, but I just, uh, it, 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 there's a lot of shit out there for sure. Yeah, and they're posting like five second little snippets of like, and then that's the clip. That's all they got. It's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like awful. But it's just, it's weird that we're all with the internet now and like what Schultz is like created, we're all just trying to find our angle in on the comedy game and people right. are trying to skip the being funny part, I guess is the first thing. Yeah. But the, it just, again, it comes with time. You mm-hmm. know, if you're, if you're doing this for the long haul, you know, the cream ro- will rise to the top. So it just, it's a matter of perseverance. And you've been doing this 13 years and, um, you know, it's, it doesn't sound like you're going to get a tech job or work in a cubicle. So, I'm in, I'm so you're yeah. off to the races. Yeah, you're fine. So what, as, a, as we land this plane here, um, something I always ask comedians as we're talking about struggling on stage is like their worst bombing or their worst like booze story. Um, like what, what comes to mind that just gives you PTSD? Um, <laughs> I don't know that I have PTSD from anything. I, I think any of the worst bombs was always a lesson, right? So mm. there was one where I was like two or three years in. Uh, these kids are standing up, working over their bill. I'm trying to pacify the situation. They keep talking. They're ignoring me. Um, I say something to the one kid. He says something really racist back to me. This girl says something, and I say something really offensive back to her. And next thing I know, a bar stool gets chucked. <gasps> splits the back of my head open. I got eight <laughs> staples. And what happened was I went to the emergency room that day. I got eight staples. I go back to the comic strip the next day because I'm like, I'm still going to fucking perform. I don't give a shit. I was concussed, but, you know, I didn't really know much (laughs) about it. (laughs) And then on my headshot, people taped staples to my headshot and called me the chairman, (laughs) which, again, I think is fucking hilarious. But the cops called and said, do you want to press charges? You know, we, we reviewed it with the club. We know who it is via the credit card. And I said, no, because it's my lesson to learn. And the lesson was, when you're a stand-up comedian, you can't, you can't lose control of the room. You can't let your emotions get the best of you. You always got to rise above it and be better. And it was that situation that told me, okay, keep your fucking cool. Always maintain levity in the room and be a professional. And I wasn't professional in that moment. So I deserve to have that happen to me. As much as maybe I should have pressed charges, who knows? It was still my lesson to learn. It was a tough lesson to learn. But it's a lesson that I never fucking forgot. And it made me a much better comic. So it's, you know, you never learn from successes. You always learn from the failures. And, mm. uh, and that was a, a major one for me. Um, the only thing that success brings is just, you know, <laughs> more whiskey. You're like, of course. Yeah. Like when there's success, you're like, of course I killed. Of course I got this. I'm the chosen one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> of course. Yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> it's me. Yeah. What do you want to do next? Like, did you just say, is your Amazon special? Did you say it's your last special? Uh, well, it's called somewhere? The Last Late Night because it's talk shows are, are, are dying. Mm-hmm. They're not as relevant. So that's why I called it The Last Late Night. It was like a way to pay homage to it. But I'll be honest with you. I don't think our specials are relevant. I don't think they'll ever be relevant. I don't think people give a fuck anymore. I think 
if anything, they watch 15 minutes of a Netflix or Amazon and wherever the fuck they're watching it, and they may come back to it or not. But really, where they're seeing it is on our phone. You're seeing clips. You're seeing it all broken down. So why put the production value into it? Why do it unless you know for 10 percent of the comedians it makes for a great spectacle? But it's like you could still film that all for a lot less because it's just going to end up on somebody's phone Mm -hmm. in a 30 second minute long clip. That's where everybody's getting it. And after doing that last hour, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm not even motivated to write anything again. I'm fucking around. I'm doing crowd work. I'm doing these monologue jokes. It's a lot of fun, but I still got to figure out the next step. I don't know. You don't know what you want to do next. No clue. I mean, I've got three scripts on the back burner. One's about to go, uh, that I'll, uh, I've written that I'll direct. Um, and uh, other than that, I just, you know, uh, I'm doing these podcasts, revamping those out of New York City, and I'll start filming a lot more of the crowd work the next year and putting it up and showing people what the fuck real crowd work is like. <laughs> yes. So I'm excited about that, yeah. But other than that, I think the world of stand-up is changing so fast. Again, like to your point, I'm trying to figure, figure it out for myself, but I, I just, uh, a little disillusioned right now with, with it all because I just, after you do something like The Last Late Night, which nobody else has done anything like it you're just like what now what now because that's so outside the box so I'm, i i don't know i gotta figure it out yeah we don't I, that's so funny that <laughs> i'm 13 years i'm like i don't know and you're yeah. 25 years and you're like i don't know but then there's like I don't know, yeah. one year comics are like i don't know <laughs> nobody knows but i think you just want to whatever it is you're doing you want to have fun you want to be proud of it and uh i'm certainly proud of the of the last late night for sure yeah, it's a beautiful special. It was so well produced. And uh, the last thing we end this with is like any uh, favorite closing advice for young comics out there. <sighs> closing advice for young comics, I would just say, uh, just do the fucking work. Mm. There's so many. There's so many people that don't want to do the work, and um, whether it's just getting up, whether it's being professional, whether it's working on new material, whether it's pushing yourself, um, it, it's it's shocking to me over the last few years, even working on projects and throwing out offers to people, seeing how fucking lazy comedians are it's Mm. bananas to me i'm really blown away and that's why i've always had confidence in myself because i'm like well i know this i'll fucking outwork everybody no matter who it is so um it's it's mind-blowing how lazy comics are i'm really i i don't even know what else to say (laughs) just fucking blown away i could i could rattle off some big names in terms of people you just be like what Uh, fucking lazy really crazy crazy how how much people want to be spoon fed or how they don't want to think outside the box or how they don't want to create or write for themselves it, it's mind blowing to me and that's that's why a lot of the you know elder statesmen of the comedy scene in terms of like feature films right you think about you know when's the last time you saw a good R rated comedy but a lot of those guys Will Ferrell Ben Stiller Vince Vaughn Owen Wilson um, Adam Sandler the common theme all those great comedic voices have in terms of feature is that they all write for themselves. Mm. They're not just doing sketch. They all are very hands-on in terms of story development and narrative. And a lot of comics are bubbling up and they don't want to take the time to learn narrative. They don't want to take the time to learn how to write for themselves. They just want to be pitching, you know, uh, paired with somebody that's going to write for themselves, and then two or three years in, then they fucking get it, and then it's too late. So I would strongly suggest picking up a book like Save the Cat, which is one of the easiest books to read on narrative uh, in terms of the feature space. And, and once you learn that, I think it makes you a better performer. You appreciate features, and then you appreciate, you know, when you have the opportunity, you have two or three projects to give a manager, an agent, a production company, uh, and not enough comics have, have done the work to, to get there. So Perfect. Yeah. Well, do you mind uh, uh, just looking at the camera, saying your name, and why people should listen to Hot Breath? Hey, I'm Steve Byrne. You should listen to Hot Breath because, because, because. That's why. Okay? It's got everything you need. It's got comics. It's got great a great hairline. Look at, uh, 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 look at this. <laughs> this is every kid that that's massacring a school with an ar-15 right here <laughs> with a microphone don't let that foolish don't let that smile fool you it's a fucking angry guy trust me all right <laughs>